1973. The Vietnam War was over for Americans, and our loved ones came home. That same year, the Watergate burglars pleaded guilty to breaking into the National Democratic headquarters. And a Senate committee began investigating the possibility of a cover-up by the Nixon White House. On October 6, 1973, Yom Kippur on the Jewish calendar, Israel was nearly crushed by a full-scale Arab invasion. The United States reacted impulsively by cutting off military aid to Israel. When we finally reversed our policy and airlifted arms to our besieged allies, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, retaliated by halting the flow of oil to the U.S., Western Europe, and Japan. The Arab oil embargo lasted almost six months and represented what many feel was the most revolutionary shift of power in modern history. Within weeks, the most powerful country in the world became the hostage of the Arab nations and their refusal to ship oil to the U.S. Not since World War II had America faced such an acute energy shortage. Gasoline prices quickly doubled, and customers panicked. Fearing they might run out of gas, many lined up for hours to put even a few gallons in their tanks. You know, the other day I was about an hour on the line, and when I got to the line, the guy said, sorry, I'm out of gas. So I shut the car off, I called a cab, I couldn't get a cab. So I just started walking home. But then I got scared because it's not safe either. To encourage conservation, President Nixon ordered gas stations closed on Sundays. And several states began rationing programs. The president also pushed for a nationwide commitment to make America totally independent of foreign oil by 1980. Nixon centered his master plan on two major energy sources, the nation's vast supply of coal reserves and the rapid development of nuclear energy. If you're going to have a clean and beautiful environment in this country, we have to have a new source of energy, plentiful and clean, and we can have that new source of energy. The place to get it, one of the major places to get it, certainly, is through the development of nuclear energy. President Nixon's commitment to nuclear energy created a new industry. By the beginning of 1974, 42 plants were in operation, 56 were under construction, and 100 more were on the drawing boards. The Arab oil embargo ended in March 1974, and so did the energy crisis facing the nation. America returned to its old ways, guzzling gasoline, avoiding mass transportation, and ignoring the new mandatory 55-mile speed limit. The energy crisis had come and gone, and America had survived it. The casual way we put the energy crisis behind us was different than our response to another crisis of resources, the danger of environmental collapse. The word ecology, derived from the Greek word for house, entered our vocabulary in the 70s. We were belatedly concerned about our habitat, our rivers and lakes, as well as the air and earth itself. We began to fear that our free enterprise system might actually be destroying our natural resources. Environmentalists became our new gurus and rushed to restore the delicate balance between industry and nature. But in some cases, it was too late. The unrestrained use of petrochemical fertilizers in farming had created vast nitrogenous wastes that strangled rivers and lakes. Lake Erie had died, and Cleveland's Cuyahoga River was filled with enough pollutants to become a fire hazard. Industry had discovered it could lower production costs by using plastics instead of metal or paper. These man-made materials did reduce costs, 
but they left enormous amounts of non-biodegradable waste that we foolishly burn for decades. It is true that when you burn PVC, you generate hydrogen chloride, but to the best information that we have available, this does not constitute a hazard. In 1969, the Department of Agriculture banned the use of the pesticide known as DDT. During World War II, DDT was called a miracle chemical. But after 20 years, it was clear that DDT was destroying the ecological balance, weakening, for example, the shells of birds' eggs. Some farmers fought the ban. We ban all of these chemicals. I really think that in time we're going to have a, a food problem. As far as Lake Michigan is concerned, it has not yet reached that point. As the 1970s as began, now, President Nixon signed the Environmental Policy and Act. And become like Lake the new law gave America its Sanders first major program to rescue our natural that habitat. Why, with all of the various priorities, all of the programs that are demanding attention for a limited federal budget this year, we put as our first priority the environment. Because as important as all the other areas are, here is an area where if we do not act now, it will be too late, possibly, ever to act again. This is for the people! Fight on! When the Vietnam War ended, many of the young anti-war activists turned their energies to ecology and the new survival ethic. In April of 1970, students staged the first Earth Day, a national teach-in to publicize the ecological crisis facing not only America, but the world. At the University of Michigan, the students marched beyond Ann Arbor's city limits to return thousands of soft drink cans to their spawning grounds, the Coca-Cola bottling plant. The Coca-Cola men looked on with something between disgust and dismay. But they were in for a surprise, because having made the point that they vastly preferred returnable bottles to non-returnable cans, the students proceeded to clean up the mess. So much of their spirit was in it that they left the lawn in front of the plant considerably cleaner than it was before they arrived. I think the people we're talking for today are the biggest silent majority of all. The silent majority that isn't even born. If we don't make the right choice for them, then we're, they have no chance. To many environmentalists, the Nixon administration's commitment to ecology seemed indecisive at times. On Earth Day, the administration announced approval of an oil pipeline across 800 miles of Alaskan tundra. A move the environmentalists said would endanger the fragile balance of nature. Trying to compete with the French and British Concorde, President Nixon also approved our building supersonic jets, despite strong evidence that these aircraft were a threat to the ozone layer that protected the Earth from excessive radiation. While the administration endorsed supersonic transportation, the Congress did not. And in March of 1971, Congress refused to subsidize these new planes. During the 1970s, many environmentalists focused on our endangered species, the animals forced to live on our unclean land and in our polluted air. We also began to cry out against the slaughter of dolphins, whales, and baby seals. Activists tried to stop the annual seal hunt, but with little success. This has to be one of the most unnecessary uh, wildlife slaughters in the world. Those magnificent animals out there are killed just to provide uh, souvenir trinkets, little wallets, purses, slippers, nothing that man needs, absolutely nothing. But I'm hoping that maybe in a couple of years we might have this thing beat. The most controversial frontier of science in the 1970s was genetic engineering. Scientists finally found a way to combine the genes of one living organism with the genes of another. The building blocks of genes are DNA molecules. DNA carries the hereditary information for every living organism. It tells bird cells, for example, to make wings and feathers instead of fish scales and fins. Some scientists believe that splicing DNA of one species with DNA of another could create deadly new diseases. It was an idea so stunning that scientists voluntarily stopped all major experiments for two years to draw up safety rules. 
During the 1970s, cancer continued to terrorize us. For decades, doctors believed cancer was a viral disease. But new research provided evidence that many forms of cancer were caused by environmental factors, like cigarette smoking, additives in foods and beverages, and toxic wastes. By the end of the decade, the evidence was overpowering that as much as 20% of all cancer might be work-related. The logical conclusion seemed to be, if America could clean up its working environments, then it might have found a non-medical cure for some cancers. New attitudes toward the causes of sickness motivated many Americans to practice wellness and preventive medicine. These new attitudes ignited a physical fitness explosion. Millions of Americans took to the nation's roadways, and the running boom was born. Even President Jimmy Carter joined the joggers. This is a very difficult course. I hope Jimmy. Jimmy says he will um, win if he finishes. <laughs> America's new passion for physical fitness also made many of us focus on our atrocious eating habits. During the 70s, the average American ate two meals a day away from home. Fast food had become as American as microwave apple pie. McDonald's sold one billion hamburgers every five months. For many, the national diet was a national crisis. Trying to change our diets that depended on processed foods and artificial additives, many health-conscious Americans began cooking and baking again. For the first time since World War II, many of us grew our own vegetables. By 1976, sales of canned meat, fish, and chicken dropped dramatically. In some cases, up to 60%. With Weight Watching a sudden obsession with many of us, the sale of cookbooks skyrocketed. And even Julia Child turned her attention from rich French cuisine to simpler, healthier American dishes. Diet-crazy Americans even cut back on their alcohol. Light beer and sparkling water became big hits during the 70s. I know how dirty city water can be with rusted pipes, and you never know what you're really drinking. That's why I prefer bottled water. What is your occupation? I am a plumber. While the U.S. struggled to gain control of its environment and its weight, Another shakeup in the Middle East created a second energy crisis for America. The civil war in Iran against the rule of the Shah sharply reduced world oil production and raised gasoline prices to well over a dollar a gallon for the first time. While Americans rallied round the gas pump and learned to live with yet another energy crunch, some of our worst nightmares about nuclear power seemed about to be realized. A nuclear plant at Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania threatened to explode and shower the countryside with deadly radiation. A stuck valve had caused the facility's reactor core to overheat. And while technicians worked desperately to avert a cataclysmic meltdown, a hundred thousand people left their homes. It took two weeks to bring the reactor under control, and the near disaster shocked the nation into rethinking its commitment to nuclear power. In 1969, just 10 years before the Three Mile Island accident, American astronauts made their historic first journey to the moon. And before Project Apollo ended in 1972, we made six more trips there. We're now in the approach phase, everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. Skylab was the next manned space flight. The program was begun in 1973. Launched first was a two-story orbital workshop. Then, the first of three three-man crews departed to meet, join, and begin living in the orbiting laboratory. Those crews would stay 28, 59, and 84 days, respectively. The major objective was to find out if astronauts could physically withstand extended stays in space and continue to do useful work there. The answer was a resounding yes. The, 
Apollo Soyuz project, a joint endeavor between the Soviet Union and the United States, was launched in 1975. The mission called for a mutual docking and crew exchange to develop the necessary equipment for international space rescues. During the 1970s, NASA's unmanned planetary programs were giving scientists exciting new glimpses into the history of the solar system. The Viking program investigated the planet Mars. Two separately launched Viking spacecraft traveled 420 million miles to the mysterious red planet. The Viking lander's robot arm conducted chemical and biological tests on the soil in search of life forms. unmanned Voyager spacecraft carried a record with the sights and sounds of Earth, just in case they encountered a cosmic neighbor along the way. Their interplanetary journey was destined to take them past Jupiter and Saturn, and eventually one Voyager was to pass close to Uranus and Neptune. The 1970s were years of crisis for America. Watergate and Vietnam left festering wounds. Twice we were held captive by the oil-producing Arab countries. Many of our natural resources were contaminated. Our atmosphere was threatened. But despite the problems of the decade, or perhaps because of them, we began a serious reassessment of ourselves and our habitat. As the 70s ended, we anxiously wondered whether our world, as we had always known it, would survive. We often think of conservation only in terms of sacrifice. In fact, it is a most painless and immediate way of rebuilding our nation's strength. Every gallon of oil each one of us saves is a new form of production. It gives us more freedom, more confidence, that much more control of our own lives. So the solution of our energy crisis can also help us to conquer the crisis of the spirit in our country. It can rekindle our sense of unity, our confidence in the future, and give our nation and all of us individually a new sense of purpose. You know we can do it. We have the natural resources. We have more oil in our shale alone than several Saudi Arabias. We have more coal than any nation on earth. We have the world's highest level of technology. We have the most skilled workforce with innovative genius. And I firmly believe that we have the national will to win this war. I do not promise you that this struggle for freedom will be easy. I do not promise a quick way out of our nation's problems.